Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The reason why uh, you, you see this last is that you're losing minerals by sending two probes out to go to each main. Uh, in this case, <laughs> I mean, if they <laughs> check for it, you lose. It's a hundred percent loss. Yeah. Oh! oh! Oh the drone's my god. This is insane. He has spotted it. The spawning pool is right there. If this somehow goes off, that spawning pool will die very quickly. Now, but I, I, oh my god. What you just heard is a live commentary by Nick Plot and Dan Stemkowski of a match in the Global StarCraft 2 League. While some may believe this is just a video game, StarCraft 2 is one of the most famous titles played competitively by professional gamers. Esports, as the discipline is called, is a fast-growing, dynamic, and profitable industry with full-time players who regularly compete for six-figure prize money. Seoul has become a global hub for esports due to the presence of top-ranked players, a solid industry ecosystem, and large audiences eager to watch competitions live. Esports in Korea have become a cultural phenomenon in their own right. Successful gamers have their own fan base and train like professional athletes. Big companies are eager to sponsor teams and competitions. There are television channels devoted to live gaming, and the government is actively promoting esports abroad. Our guest for this episode, Nick Plot, is at the very center of esports in Korea. A former professional StarCraft gamer in the United States, Nick moved to Seoul to work for the Korean broadcasting company GOM TV and became the first Western StarCraft commentator in the country. He and his co caster, Dan Stemkowski, known in the industry under the nicknames Tasteless and Artosis, are now considered the most famous esports commenting duo in the world and have become major celebrities in their own right. Nick kindly agreed to talk to us about his work as a professional caster, the unique features of Korean video game culture, and of course, the rise of Seoul as a major hub for esports worldwide. Nick Plot, welcome to Korea in the World. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, let's start the interview by jumping back a decade. Ten years ago, you were uh, in college in America playing video games on a competitive basis, especially StarCraft. You were uh, among the world's best. What happened since then? Um, why did you turn from being a player uh, to being a commentator? And why did you move from the United States to South Korea? Well, first, I wouldn't say I was one of the world's best, but I was, I was good for uh, an American. I went to several tournaments uh, as a professional gamer back in StarCraft 1 and eventually ended up losing to my younger brother, actually, in one of those tournaments. And there was an MC on stage who did not really have any StarCraft experience, so I offered to go up and help him. And then from there, I ended up picking up a series of gigs, some overseas, some in the States. I went to Italy and Singapore uh, and Korea once before moving here. And I did that for maybe three or four years, and eventually uh, a job opening uh, happened here in Korea, and I was the only guy with a resume that big. You've been in Korea for several years now? Uh, seven years now. Seven years. Um, what keeps you here? Is it the best place to work as an esports commentator? Or do you just like living here? Or is there it's, something else? It's, I think it's all those. I'm certainly happy here. Uh, I'm much more comfortable living in Korea and in Seoul than I am in the States. Where is that? I, first of all, I love the culture, I love the food. But also, if you work in esports, it's the perfect place to be. There's um, always tournaments going on uh, where you can commentate or you can play in. There's a ton of gaming going on down here. There's a lot of esports stuff going on overseas, but Seoul is so concentrated mm. with the esports events that it's really good for someone in a job role like mine. Do you have a typical work day, and how much do you have to prepare for work? How many hours a day or, or a week do you spend on there? What's the what's the usual deal? My work in Korea is usually about two to three days of, a week of broadcasting. When I'm not broadcasting, I uh, obviously am watching tournaments or playing games. Uh, and trying to keep up to date with what's going on. And a broadcast day, uh, I usually broadcast for about a four-hour period unscripted, and then I have about maybe two hours of preparation, stuff mm -hmm. like makeup. I meet up with my co-host, who is Artosis or Dan Simkowski, and um, we usually go over you know, how the broadcast is going to go. And then there's a short period afterwards where we'll have a beer and kind of go over how that day went. When listening to you um, commenting, it's hard to ignore how exhausting it all sounds. And it's also very hard for for those who listen to understand if they don't know anything about the game. Is that a fair assessment? What we try to do is uh, you know, appeal to the hardcore fans of StarCraft. Uh, these are people that watch StarCraft almost every day, basically. And then we try to make it as accessible as possible. It's a bit difficult because uh, there's such a heavy vernacular hmm. when you're you know, talking about a game in depth. And uh, we try to use 
terminology that'll you know make the hardcore viewers happy, but at the same time, you want to try to bring in uh, as many new people as possible. While you live in Korea, you're, you comment, of course, in English for an international audience. Where are these people from and, and also when do you broadcast? Uh, and also if we may ask uh, how many people actually tune in. First of all, we have viewers from all over the world. Due to the birth of streaming, you're able to broadcast anywhere uh, to anybody in the world that has decent internet. So we have a ton of viewers in the United States, in Sweden, Australia, Germany. Pretty much every country with decent internet, we get uh, some number of viewers from. Uh, I don't believe I can give the exact numbers mm. for the viewers uh, of Guam, but we, I think for roughly the concurrency you'd see on Twitch, we have between uh, 10 to 20,000 live viewers. I don't know what the VOD views are, but mm. I know they're pretty good. Uh, and it is uh, on a pretty heavy subscription model. Do you see a difference between regular events and the big championships? How many people would be listening oh, in well, for the, the, the major uh, matches? So a, a major match uh, that I've done, uh, you can get several hundred thousand tuning in. But let's say it's an early qualifier for a tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, the numbers get much lower. But uh, when you get to a major esports event uh, broadcasted in English, the numbers get quite high. Korea has a reputation of being the country that is crazy about esports. The Korean government capitalizes a lot on it and promotes the country as the uh, quote unquote mecca for esports. From your perspective, is this correct? Is that the app description or is it a mere stereotype? Well, Korea has been the center of esports for a long time. This has probably been going on for about maybe 14 years. Korea has been a powerhouse in that. But it's, it's more so a powerhouse in the quality of players it produces. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, esports is expanding uh, massively uh, worldwide. I believe globally in the last three years, it's grown 800% each year. So the viewership for, for you know, English-speaking viewers to watch high-quality gamers play against each other, uh, the demand's pretty high. Hmm. So uh, it's definitely a good place to be. There are plenty of esports tournaments and events going on uh, around the world. You have uh, DreamHack, ESL, MLG, and new ones like Gfinity uh, and plenty of others popping up all over the place. So it's really becoming quite global. But the best gamers overall, as long as Koreans are taking an interest, tend to be Koreans. But what sets esports in Korea um, apart from other countries? The number of players or the size of the tournaments or the, the entire culture surrounding competitive gaming? Why, why Korea? Why not in you know, another country? Well, people oftentimes say, why Korea? But I think the real question is, why Seoul? Hmm. Because all the pro gamers are in Seoul. So back uh, in the 80s, there was a, a ban on a lot of uh, Japanese cultural products, like games or movies. So uh, the people that were playing games or were interested in playing games at the time were going into uh, PC games. Uh, and we'll take StarCraft for this example because that's where it started uh, early on. The people would then take an interest in PC games at the same time because the Koreans take schooling so seriously. There's no way a Korean parent at the time would buy a console for their kid over a computer where mm. they can do their homework on a computer. That combined with the explosion of PC cafes everywhere uh, really led to the perfect environment for people to start competing and learning games. When you're in Seoul, there's a PC cafe basically on every corner. And... You know, Seoul being a really expensive city, really the two things you can do in Seoul cheaply are, are go to a PC cafe or drink a bottle of soju. And so what you end up with is, uh, you know, this perfect environment for everybody to get exposed to games, to learn games, to watch other people play games, to communicate with each other sitting next to, um, you know, their friend, their ally or their opponent. And that's really why it's been so perfect. And you can't quite find another city globally that has that number of computer cafes that are affordable with high quality PCs um, and a culture that just embraces this uh, idea of, you know, playing a game all day, whether it's studying all day or playing a game all day, you're going to you're going to be the best at it. Hmm. A recent New York Times article labeled esports as a national pastime in Korea. Is this the case? It seems like this is mainly a hobby for a sizable but small part in, the, in effect of the population, and that is young guys. For spectators, I'd say it's a national pastime. Mm. You, you can get on the train and just look over at somebody's phone and see, let's say, a League of Legends match being watched on their phone. When you say uh, spectating esports is a big pastime, it is. People playing competitively as an esports, that's always going to be much smaller. Yeah, I think it would be correct to say it's, it, for viewership, it's a pastime, it's quite big. I think generally in the Western media, it is common to see Korean pro gamers labeled as superstars. And does that also actually hold true. At times it seems like the majority of the population rather sees them as, as nerds, maybe they dropped out of school, 
Um, is there a dubious image here as well, like in the West? What's, what's well, I think it's like this. You have, whenever you have somebody who's the best at something, they're mm -hmm. going to be a superstar. Now, are all programmers superstars? No. But if you take the very top echelon of that, uh, those guys, when they come to my studio uh, and play, uh, they have fangirls showing up and tons of guys showing up cheering for them. So there's definitely support for them. At the same time, though, if you have a, a lower tier player uh, who would probably be less of a you know, well-known player, he probably doesn't make much money, mm -hmm. hasn't won any tournaments. So in that case, you know, not a lot of popularity. You are a foreigner who permanently moved to Korea due to a esport career. Um, there are a number of other non-Koreans who made this step. So is Korea the only country that makes people move from uh, their home for this purpose? Uh, no. In the past few years, there have been, as far as commentators, some players moving in between Europe uh, yeah. and North America. So uh, you can end up relocating your life to commentate esports. But uh, when I first came out here, I was the only person doing this. And now I think there's about eight other, mm -hmm. seven or eight other people out here commentating full time. The um, Korean reputation for esports is first and foremost connected to one game, StarCraft. Can you maybe explain in a few words what is StarCraft for the non-initiated and how does it compare to and what, what sets it apart from other games? So when you look at the game, it looks like a war in space, but what it really is is chess in real time hmm. with uh, economics thrown in. So in a, in a chess game, you can't build pawns or, or a queen. In, in StarCraft, you can and so that's basically what StarCraft is, is it's a one-on-one -on -one competitive game. Uh, it was back then and it still is now the uh, most popular one-on-one -on -one eSport. And why did it become so popular? And is it still popular after, if I'm correct, 15 years? Uh, it's, it's still very popular now. There's StarCraft 1 and there's StarCraft 2, which are both doing quite well. So I know StarCraft Bird War is currently ranked fourth most played in PC cafes. Uh, number one is League of Legends. I believe StarCraft 2 is 18. Uh, right now in PC cafes. Mm -hmm. StarCraft 2 is much more popular globally. Uh, StarCraft 1 is more popular by uh, a margin in, in Korea, but they're, they're both doing well. So you actually have two games mm -hmm. uh, in the same brand that are both doing well. But why did StarCraft 2 not overtake StarCraft 1 in terms of popularity? I think that uh, Koreans were just very used to it. Uh, at the time, when I first moved out to Korea, there were two TV stations. It was on GameNet and NBC. NBC game, I should say, and they had StarCraft on 24 hours. So they were always playing StarCraft matches or doing StarCraft-related TV shows. And when you put uh, anything on cable TV that's on here that much, everybody just knows about it. So whenever I go to, um, people ask me what my job is, if I say I'm a StarCraft commentator, in English they go, oh. Like right. every, everybody <laughs> in Korea knows what, what this is. Uh, StarCraft 2, it's done fine in Korea, but I think at the time StarCraft 1 was as big as League of Legends is now in Korea. So, um, and the fact that one is still good, mm. but they're both still doing fine. But what about what about championships? Wh which of the game is, is played the most in the one that you would then uh, comment? Well, globally, StarCraft 2 mm. is played much more. Mm. So there's more tournaments uh, all over the world for StarCraft 2. And I believe there are more tournaments for StarCraft 2 in Korea as well, but there's still a good following for StarCraft 1. Um, so you mentioned other games like League of Legends. Are the skills that you need to play these games um, transferable? Will a great StarCraft II player excel um, in another game once uh, he gets familiar with it? I mean, you certainly could, but I think the biggest difference between League of Legends and StarCraft is that League of Legends requires teamwork and communication. In StarCraft, you're just playing by yourself. So if you're somebody who can communicate well and you're, you're even-tempered, uh, I think you certainly could become a pro gamer at League of Legends or, or any other MOBA. But Mechanically, I'd say, yeah, I mean, mm. certainly, I think StarCraft is easily a more mechanically demanding game than a MOBA, so in that sense, you could switch over. Do you see a difference between what is played um, on the competitive level and what amateurs play for fun and, and all those PC bums? You, you can play any of these games on a, a kind of casual, relaxed level. You can go, you know, after work or after school with your friends and, let's say, play League of Legends or play a game of StarCraft uh, and have fun, and it can be relaxing. But if you're going to do it on an esports level, it, it's much more intense, much more serious. So, you know, for instance, with League, you have a lot of people that go recreationally to a cafe to play it. With one-on-one -on -one games, you, you tend to see that a lot less for multiplayer. Korean players have the reputation of being the world's best, at least when it comes to StarCraft. Why is that? What sets them apart from the players from other countries? In Korean esports, there's been a, a long period where there's been team houses. And team houses actually look like a PC cafe in an apartment. 
So you have all these PCs lined up. All these players play against each other and talk about the game. We'll have people come and clean the house and make them food, like a maid, basically. So all these guys have to do is focus on getting better and practicing. I think also Korea has a very, uh, culturally has a very good attitude on working hard. Hmm. And so uh, I've noticed Korean players complain, I'd say a little bit less than you see uh, outside of Korea. And I think that that's the primary factor. Now we are seeing team houses pop up within the the States and um, parts of Europe, but I don't know if they have the same regimen. Also, the advantage of having a team house in, in Seoul specifically is that you can get to one of, let's say, five or six different studios that host tournaments mm. all the time. So not only do you get a good place to play, but you're a 15 to 20 minute car ride away from the tournament as well. Whereas if you're, let's say, in the United States or Europe, you have to get on an airplane, fly somewhere, get in a, get in a hotel, and then you know with all that, you have to deal with jet lag, the uh, time lost, not training, because you're on a plane. And I think that's why Korea is probably the best environment can you tell us maybe more about those gamer houses? Um, how do we imagine their daily routine? Are they just essentially playing the whole day? Or is there more to that? Like coaching maybe? or Sure. Each house is a little bit different. Uh, to give you a rough outline, they all have to wake up at a certain hour. Most of the houses require them to do some form of exercise. Because obviously that's good for the mind. And these guys are going on TV. So you don't want to be completely out of shape. It does depend on the team though. And then they would probably train for four to five uh, hours. Uh, eat a meal. Or, you know, wherever that break would be, hmm. there's certain setups where they'll have one player watch another player play and ask questions, or they'll set up two players to, to practice against each other and uh, discuss. And, you know, I don't get to spend much time in the training houses, but from the people I've talked to, this is sort of how it works. Some houses are a little bit more free flow, other houses uh, more strict. Some teams have rules about uh, going out uh, too much because, hmm. you know, they don't want their players going out and, and drinking or, or doing anything that's going to interfere uh, too much with the practice. But it really does depend on, on the specific team. But in a sense, this is really close to the life of a professional athlete. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Is this, uh, you already mentioned a bit uh, about that, but is it actually healthy? Um, Korea has a large scale problem with gaming addiction. There have been many numerous reports about players with serious health issues, some of them of a physical nature, for example, uh, arm muscles. Being damaged. Um, well, I mean, let's be like realistic here. Like sitting all day is not healthy. It's been proven that sitting is quite bad for you. Also, staring at a screen is is obviously not going to make you live longer. Uh, but that being said, you know these these teams do take it upon themselves to really try to keep the guy really healthy um, and in good shape. The uh, muscle injuries you're talking about in the arm is either tendonitis or carpal tunnel, which is the same uh, injuries you'd get if you were a secretary, for instance, typing mm-hmm. all day. It is something that has to be taken seriously. There's been pro gamers that have had to have surgeries. Um, and if you get, uh, you know, those tendons get too inflamed or too damaged, you actually have to stop being a pro gamer. So it's mm-hmm. pretty serious. And I know there have been pro gamers where, you know, they're in a tournament and, you know, the doctor says that they really should take, you know, a few weeks off from the computer because their you know, <laughs> tennis are inflamed, but they're maybe in the final eight of a major tournament that's going on for several weeks, and some of these guys push themselves mm. through that even. But it's, it's definitely uh, serious. I think the next question would be, who pays for all these training houses, all the support for these pro gamers, and what would be their, their interest there? Uh... Well, for instance, in Korea, most of the major StarCraft teams are backed by major Korean companies. So SK Telecom, KT, for example, Jin Air Green Wings, uh, the team, which is an airline, uh, they're all backed. And it's sort of like a giant advertisement, right? So uh, most of the teams are huge commercials for these companies. Uh, and let's say you watch an esports match, that can take three or four hours. You're going to have ads plastered all over the pro gamer and mm. everything else. So uh, the, the governing body for the majority of that is KESPA, which is uh, all... Uh, these major companies together have a one body with all these teams under them and certain regulatory rules. Yeah, I mean, those are the main people. If you go overseas, it can be a variety of things. The major sponsor for tournaments, for instance, is energy drinks. But uh, we're seeing new people come in uh, or new companies come in. The other one is obviously peripherals. So if you're selling hmm. mice or um, you know a computer chair, that would be a good sponsor as well. Many of the most successful players in Korea are very young. Um, the winner of the Global StarCraft II League's first season of 2015 was barely 18 years old when he got the trophy. Are these players full-time professionals and then dropping out of school? 
And isn't it a risky bet to forsake a university education, especially so in South Korea, a country that values high education so much? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely a risk. Um, I think, though, anything that you're going to go into that competitive, you are probably taking a risk, right? Like you're going to mm. go into acting instead of following, you know, any, any sort of athlete may be putting themselves at risk. That being said, uh, I think if you're going to be a professional gamer, you can't really do school and, and work. It's kind of one or the other. You know, one thing that is a reality is that there are professional gamers who make it for a little bit and then they end up retiring. They don't have a lot of life skills. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, there are other professional gamers that become you know, great coaches or, or commentators. Uh, and I think you'll see that in any industry, really. You know that it's high, highly competitive, and you know you have people that really have to give up everything to to pursue it. If we look at the winners again of the Global StarCraft II League from the past years, we see that none of them were older um, than 22 years of age at the time. Do professional esport players have a peak age? Um, why don't we see older and potentially more experienced players dominating the the industry or the competitions? Well, I, I know for StarCraft, it, yes, it is generally younger players. I the people that I've talked to, I, the players I've talked to. Uh, oftentimes when they get older they just say they don't want to be in a team house for that long hmm. uh, some of them can continue to compete but not win at that level so we do have players in our tournaments let's take the GSL which I host for instance we have some players who are, who are older uh, than that but the majority of them that are the best are good at one thing on that StarCraft and that's all they focus on you mentioned retirement um, so how do you transfer from that life to a normal life? And do they stay in the industry, take other positions, for example, as commentators, just like you are doing? There's, a, you know, because the esports scene is so big here, there's a lot of job openings for these pro gamers. Being on a coach, being a coach or on a coaching staff, working at, you know, let's say a KESPA or, you know, any tournament organizer. The ones that don't become to work in esports, I'm not sure what exactly happens with them, but there's definitely... There's definitely a system set up for some of these guys if they hmm. want to pursue other other goals. Although I'd still say it's it's there's not a lot of spots, right? For the number of professional gamers you have, there's not as many spots for people that want to then work in esports, which is also a competitive industry to work in as well. Esports in Korea and worldwide, it seems, is dominated by male players. What about women? Could couldn't one expect them to compete on eye level uh, with the the male players, or are there any? You know, I, it, it's a tough one to explain. Really, um, I wish I had a, a good answer for you. I I think people would be very excited to see female pro gamers, let's say in Korea, competing at the very very top, and maybe that will change with time. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to say anything to get myself in trouble. Mm. Gen- I don't know. If maybe <laughs> you know some of these uh, guys are more attracted to like culturally a more competitive environment uh, in that sense. But we'll see. Hopefully that'll change, though, in the future. Hmm. And what about the audience? Is it also uh, uh, mostly male? And where do women fit in, in that picture? And also globally, not just in Korea. I don't know the exact numbers for how many uh, female viewers we have. I know at the studio we have a good number of women coming down to watch the hmm. matches. Uh, and when I do work overseas, I see a good number of women there. I, I know it's more male-dominant, but as far as viewership goes, you know, there's definitely a good amount of female viewers. Hmm. Would you agree that esports here targets a rather narrow group of the population and is of a far less comprehensive appeal than other popular sports, for example, baseball? Well, I think as each year passes, the reach of it gets bigger because, for instance, when I was younger and I was watching uh, esports, even when I was in the States, but I would even be watching Korean esports, I was just a really young guy that played games. But now I'm 30 and there's plenty more people that play games on the internet all the time. So let's say... 10 years from now, when I'm 40 and I'm still casting, then there's going to be an even larger number of people. This has definitely missed on, uh, the older generation. We don't get, you know, let's say viewers in their 50s tuning in. Uh, and I don't think we will until maybe I'm 50 or something like that and uh, maybe still doing this. But it definitely targets, you know, the people that play games all day and want to improve at them or watch good people play. But that uh, number of people is growing with uh, every year. Do you think the, the speed and the vocabulary that is used in these broadcasts uh, makes it really hard for people who are not initiated to enjoy it? And that would maybe explain, because in other sports, you, I don't really need to know the, you know all the fine arcanes of football to enjoy football or soccer. Sure. And I mean, the reason why you don't need to know that is because you grew up with it, mm. right? You grew up with these sports. So, you know, if, if I look on TV and I see baseball, I, I know what strike is. Uh, I know what a baseball bat does. So you can look at that and and say, well, you know, we don't have to explain that as much. I think the fast paced uh, talking hopefully gets people excited and makes it, you know, pretty hype. 
I think, though, kind of going back uh, to what was talked about earlier, I think hmm. as more people are playing games, this is going to become more ubiquitous with, with viewers, essentially. So terminology won't be as much of an obstacle. How can we explain what games get popular here um, in Korea? StarCraft and League of Legends seem to dominate here, but other games such as Dota 2, which attracts massive audiences in the US and China, seems to be more of an underdog in, in South Korea. Well, okay, so let's talk about uh, Dota in Korea first. The reason why Dota is not popular in Korea is for a couple of reasons. Valve, uh, as a game company, is not particularly popular in Korea. Valve is the, the publisher. Mm -hmm. so. A lot of Koreans don't know what Counter-Strike is, which is one of the main games. They know games uh, that are modeled after Counter-Strike, like Sudden Attack or Special Force or Crossfire. So Valve doesn't have a big presence here. Uh, the other thing is that League of Legends was so, uh, and still is so disproportionately big uh, in esports. Dota 2, uh, mechanically, is a more intimidating, difficult game hmm. to play than League of Legends. Um, and I think at the time, with League being so big and there being so much money in, in it, uh, there just wasn't really the scene necessary to support a proper Dota a scene out here. Whereas in China, first of all, Dota, the original Dota, is a mod of a game called Warcraft 3. Now, Warcraft 3 was huge in China. They had a good esports uh, scene in China for Warcraft 3. And because people were playing it, because this mod, Dota, which I'd actually say is an even better game than Warcraft 3 hmm. itself is, uh, picked up, that just went everywhere in China. So in China, you could actually go outside of a... You could see boxes of Warcraft 3 outside of a game store and it would say when a sign below it this game lets you play Dota well that's how Dota got big in China hmm. for instance one that's interesting is if a player wins becomes world champion uh, at a game then that game blows up in whatever area they're in for instance I was casting maybe four years ago at WCG finals and it was a Chinese player versus a Korean player and Dan and me uh, were both joking like gosh if the Chinese player wins that means StarCraft 2 is going to blow up in China you know, which means we'll probably get more gigs in China if this guy wins. He didn't win, but uh, oftentimes that's something else that can take it. It also just depends um, on the economics of whatever place you're talking about. For instance, uh, StarCraft and a lot of these free-to-play games, they're, they're cheap. They run on any PC. For mm -hmm. instance, a lot of people in esports don't know that, you know, uh, Crossfire is big in, you know, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines... Uh, and most North Americans would look at this and, and say, why would they not want to play Counter-Strike? Well, a, a lower-end PC can run Crossfire. It's a very graphically simple game. And so it, places where the, uh, you know, they're not as economically strong, well, then they end up switching into these games instead of other games. So uh, it's also why you'll see places like, um, let's say, North America or Europe, where if you're going to get into esports, you probably have to have a pretty good computer you tend to see higher-end graphic games for the, the tournaments they do. Is Korea then, in a way, insulated from the global gaming market? Because if I understand well, a game that works really, really well in the West or, in other, or generally in other countries might not necessarily be a huge hit in Korea. Korea is insulated um, in some ways. In other ways, it's not. I mean, the fact that there's been a, a big market for English broadcasts of games. Hmm. You know, if you already are running a, a tournament in Korean, it's, it's not too much more expensive to tack on uh, an English broadcast to that and, and to advertise that and to sell subscriptions and to make money off of it. So it, it's getting better, you know, for esports in Korea, broadcasting globally, it's really a, a question of balancing what games are Koreans playing and that they're good at that Westerners will also watch. So let's take uh, the two games that have been the most successful with that is StarCraft and League of Legends. Everybody is played StarCraft basically that hmm. plays games. You know, League of Legends is the most popular game of all time. So those are two very easy models to, to get viewers for. The past years have not only seen new games uh, arise, but also growth of the esports scene in other countries, especially in China and the United States. Is Korea losing its status as the mecca of esports? Well, I would say not in, in the sense of the quality of gamers, right? Uh, Koreans are very, very good uh, at the games that they pick to play, and they pick quite a bit. I mean, not even just StarCraft or League of Legends, but a variety of the FPSs uh, that are popular in Asia. Uh, they're by far the best at Tekken. We've seen Korean players dominate uh, in Street Fighter. So what it really is is that esports has now expanded globally, so we have all these different tournaments going on. Esports is still, uh, in Korea, probably the best for regular shows. For instance, I work out at the studio about twice, two, two or three times a week, 
most of the non-Korean sports events are turned into, I don't want to say festival, but it's like a two-day big tournament that people show up to and, and watch. And then, then esports sort of at times leaves that area, hmm. right? So it's going to continue to grow. I think it's going to be fine going on into the future. Do you think the appeal of esports is currently expanding not only geographically, but also to new audiences? Or will it ultimately remain the thing that young guys do because they've got, they've got a lot of free time? Well, I think what, what it'll become as time passes is just more mainstream. Everybody that I know plays games to some extent hmm. and can at least appreciate when they see somebody who's really good at a game. Now, let's take um, somebody who's, you know, let's say they're 55. They never played games and they view it as some kind of mind-numbing waste of time. Well, they're not going to get into it. But I think as each decade passes, we're going to get more and more viewers the numbers they're projecting now are quite good for esports in the next few years, so it should continue to grow and become more mainstream and just something that people watch as a pastime. What are you expecting for the, the coming years? Uh, do you see uh, esports slowly becoming almost like a staple, something that anyone uh, in Korea or globally watches on their phone, or is it still going to remain you know, within specific audiences? For instance, I just got back from doing a broadcast for Heroes of the Storm on ESPN2, uh, so it seems to be coming more and more mainstream for the main viewers and, and gaming gaming is already mainstream but uh, I think yeah down the road it's going to just continue to grow and uh, I think probably become one of the biggest things that there is out there to watch mm. you see yeah. the global perception changing first from game to well competitive gaming which is a bit better than you know just playing a game at home and right. then actually becoming a real sports so when I was younger, gaming was still considered uh, in the States to be a you know, pretty big waste of time. It was not cool to play games. It was considered shameful uh, if you were you know, too obsessed with games. And now it's just become much more a part of everybody's life. And I think you know, eSports is still something new. I think it, when you look at the way it's covered in the news, I think we're going to know when that changes here, when it's no longer talked about as this is a thing, it really exists as... So here's what's happening in esports. It's no longer talked about as a phenomenon. I think esports will eventually get there, uh, continue to, to grow, I would say maybe in the next five to ten years. Let's conclude by going back to the Korean scene. What do you expect for the, the near future? Is the popularity of StarCraft II waning? And what about new games? For example, the just released Heroes of the Storm, which is advertised all over Seoul right now by Blizzard, which is actually the maker of the StarCraft franchise. What is, what is the next big thing going to be? StarCraft isn't growing rapidly, but the numbers are fine. It's sustainable. I know that, for instance, uh, you know, last season we had the best, uh, at GSL, the best views we've had in 15 months. But I think it's probably going to take a place sort of like tennis. If it, we were talking mm. about physical sports where tennis is always there, tennis isn't the biggest sport. But people know about tennis. People watch tennis. People know who you know, some of the best tennis players are. Uh, with uh, Heroes of the Storm, I think the challenge uh, for Blizzard with that game in Korea is can it get a spot with there's already a game that's so big, right? League of Legends is just so huge. It's the biggest game ever, and everybody in Korea plays it. I think there's a chance uh, it, it can you know make a dent or make a splash or who knows, maybe take over. Blizzard's putting a lot of money in advertising behind it. I know there's special discounts for people to go to PC cafes. You know, they get more experience, more basically more in-game rewards if they're going to PC cafes. And also, I think Heroes of the Storm as a game, I think is, is, is a much improved MOBA to its, its predecessors because it's, it's going to sound really weird to say this, but it, it actually has more than one map, for instance, which it's, it's kind of... I mean, I'm kind of amazed that this, it took this long, but you know, to have more than one competitively accessible maps is what allows a game to be fresh. You know, one thing that kept StarCraft around for such a long time is there have been countless maps and different maps end up with different strategies or players or you know essentially drama suspense they can come from that and so i know blizzard is really focusing on trying to uh, obviously release new heroes which you have to do with any moba but th to keep new maps coming out which keep the game fresh i think there's there's a good chance for it it'll be tough uh, to compete with league of legends but i think there is a good chance your career as a player and as a commentator took place in the realm of starcraft have you ever thought about changing track and focusing on a, on a different game? What about League of Legends or maybe move to Heroes of the Storm? I've actually been asked this question a lot. I, I think that I'm mostly recognized for being a StarCraft caster, but I've actually casted about a dozen different titles. Mm. In my career, I've done Warcraft 3, 
uh, World of Tanks. I've done a little bit of League of Legends, Hearthstone. Just did some Heroes of the Storm and uh, probably a bunch of other games that the English-speaking viewers wouldn't know. They were very low-end um, games that I was usually tacked on to a tournament I was already doing in Korea. They'd mm-hmm. say, we want you to do StarCraft. Can you do, like, let's say something like, you know, Kurt Ryder or... And I think, sure, okay, because, you know, I'll do that. And I've done, I've done a variety of games. I, my main shtick is StarCraft, but I'm always excited to expand it into new stuff. Hmm. I have been uh, playing a lot of Heroes of the Storm and have plans to be casting that a lot in the future. Um, I think if you're going to be a game caster uh, professionally, you have to be realistic and, and uh, be willing to, uh, to diversify. It's also, you know, it's a, it's a pretty cool gig, too, to learn new games and discover new stuff. To conclude, Nick, after 10 years of working in the StarCraft ecosystem and of watching and commentating games, do you actually still enjoy it? Or do you still play by yourself? Or is it more of a job? No, I love my job and I love StarCraft. I mean, it's sort of unreal, right? That I get to like travel around the world talking about my favorite computer game. So <laughs> uh, I love it. I, I, it's funny when you start to work in esports, you find that you have less time to play. Hmm. You know, the amount of time it takes to prepare. Uh, for the studio work and uh, traveling, for instance, I have to do for my job. I don't. It's sad because when I play StarCraft, I am just not in the shape I used to be. Right? I'm playing. I'm thinking, I was so much better than this. But um, yeah, I mean, I still love the game. And what's nice about StarCraft is uh, it is changing. It is fresh. Uh, you know, like I said, there's new maps. Legacy of the Void, which is the expansion for StarCraft, is coming out eventually. I don't know when, but it'll be out. You know, probably in a year or two. And that's going to change the game again. So then we all get to learn about that too. Um, also, you know, after listing off all the other games I've commentated, I had to spend a, a good amount of time playing that and learning that too. So uh, I stay pretty busy, but I definitely still enjoy my job. I love it. Nick, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you so much for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.